As a Jew from Iowa, it's a lot of sermons start that way. As a Jew from Iowa, let me just say that Iowan Yiddishkeit is pretty limited in its influence in the Jewish world. I don't think that comes as a big surprise to anyone. In fact, the way that most conversations usually play out when I meet someone for the first time is they ask me where I'm from and I say from Iowa and then they say there are Jews there. That is how the conversation usually goes. And the answer is no, there aren't many Jews in Iowa. And when it comes to what we're known for, well, it's usually two things. At least we're talking about Jewish Iowa here. One, my hometown of Sioux City held the pulpit of Rabbi Jules Harlow. Now, if you don't know the name of Jules Harlow, you know one of the books of Jules Harlow because Jules Harlow edited and put together the Sidur that is either in your lap or right in front of you. That blue Sidur, the Sim Shalom that we use in conservative Judaism, was compiled and edited by Jules Harlow. So that's pretty cool. That's one thing of, of Jewish Iowa that we have going for us. And the second thing that Jewish Iowa is known for, Postville. Now, it's been quite a few years, so I'm not sure if everyone remembers what happened in Postville, Iowa. Uh, and to be honest, it's pretty embarrassing to talk about and reflect on, but I think it's important for our conversation this morning. So without mentioning individual names or going into too many details, Postville, Iowa was home to a kosher slaughterhouse and meatpacking plant. Postville is a town of about 2,000 people in Northeast Iowa, tucked in the corner of Northeast Iowa, and there was a kosher meatpacking plant there. Uh, and it was called Agra Processors. Meatpacking and cattle slaughter are major industries in Iowa. So a lot of the going-ons there kind of flew under the radar, much like uh, Detroit and things in Michigan with the auto industry with such a lucrative and, and highly employed business that sometimes things can kind of go unnoticed. But something caught the attention of authorities. And one morning in 2008, the plant was raided and almost 400 immigrant workers were arrested. And the owners were also arrested and they were charged with a litany of financial and labor felonies. It was bad. It was really bad. In the religious Jewish world, we would call it a chilul Hashem, something that portrays Jews in such a negative light that it actually does damage to all of us as a whole, that it is a blemish on who we are as a people. And I don't think that's hyperbolic. I think that what happened in Postville was a chilul Hashem. But I also think that it was something more than that. And I think it presented us, the Jewish community, not just in Iowa, but around the world with an important theological and halakhic question, which is this. Is kashrut simply a matter of how we slaughter an animal that is free from, from a blemish? Or in our day and age, when kosher meat production is an industry, part of an industry, are there other ethical considerations that we need to rethink that make something kosher or not kosher? I think it's an important question. Or to put it another way, does the treatment of workers make a product usable or unusable within a Jewish ethical system? I think it's time we had the discussion because honestly, I think we've been putting it off. Because right now, our country and our world have performed a dramatic 180 from where we were almost two years ago when we hung banners from our buildings and put signs up in our yards thanking frontline workers and calling them heroes. We've done a 180. Two years later, we have a record number of people quitting their jobs for a variety of different reasons, I want to be fair, but not excluding one big one, which is that we as consumers are treating them like garbage. Workers everywhere are being verbally, financially, emotionally, and physically abused. From waiters and flight attendants to bus drivers and nurses and teachers. Oh my God, our teachers. We are seeing an attack on workers in a way that we have never seen in modern history. 
And it's easy to make excuses. It's easy to make excuses. We're all tired of COVID and we're frustrated and we're angry and we're scared. And we can admit those things and then we can go into the deeper ethical conversation that goes with that. But this morning, I'm asking us to see this as the most basic theological and halachic level for us as Jews. And here is my shita, here is my position. And I want to have this conversation and I want you to push back and I want us to be able to continue this conversation because that is what our tradition asks of us, is to wrestle with this. But here is my shita, that as Jews, if we benefit from exploitation, from abuse, from treating workers poorly, then the product that we receive should not, cannot be considered part of our religious obligation or belief. To say that in a more succinct way, if we get something, but it is at the unfair, unjust, or undignified expense of someone or something else, then it is not only unethical, it should be trafe. To put that into practical terms, what I'm saying is this, that when that kosher meatpacking plant in Postville was raided, not only were the owners arrested and charged, but I believe that the meat from that plant should instantly have become unkosher, unfit for religious Jewish consumption. Because the way that meat came to be was through the exploitation of immigrants and immigrant children. And honestly, it was probably also at the expense of the animals who, according to Jewish law, are not allowed to feel pain as part of their shechita, as part of their ritual slaughter. Now, I apologize for this because in good rabbinic fashion, I think there are way more questions here than there are answers. But here's why I think this is important and why I think we need to start talking about it, especially today in the context of our Torah reading this morning. This morning in the penultimate parsha of the book of Bereshit, of the book of Genesis, we get the culmination, this big climax of the story of Joseph. Joseph, as Rabbi Starr so beautifully summarized for us, is reunited with his brothers. And not just reunited, but they forgive one another. There's this reunification of, of this family. Joseph forgives the wrongdoing. And then Jacob, Yaakov, their patriarch, their father, is called from Canaan, from Eretz Israel, to go down to Egypt and to live with all of them in the land of Goshen, where they can survive this upcoming famine or this current famine together in the prosperous land that they're given. There in the Torah, we read that the family of Jacob grows and thrives all the way until we start the next book of our Torah in the book of Shemot. But why do they thrive? It's not a rhetorical question. I'm, I'm asking you, do, do, do you all remember why they thrive? What makes this family thrive? Anyone? If we remember back in the Torah, Joseph has these dreams, right? These dreams that there's going to be this famine coming. There's these seven skinny calves followed by the seven fat calves. And Joseph uses this dream to understand that there's a famine coming and therefore stores up grain for seven years' worth of food. Joseph takes the knowledge of his dream and saves enough food for his family and more to flourish. So when the Egyptians see this and they're suffering because they're in the middle of a famine, they come to Joseph, who they know has ample food and grain, and they come to Joseph and they say, can we have some of your food? And Joseph says, of course, but you need to sell me your cattle. And they do. And then the Egyptians come to Joseph because the famine continues, and they say, we need food. And Joseph says, okay, sell me your land. And they do. And then, this is where things get really theologically complicated. Spoiler. Then they come to Joseph and they say, we don't have anything left. We need food to survive. What can we give you? And he says, give me your freedom. 
Joseph provides the Egyptians with food on the condition that they sell themselves into slavery. Now, for over 2,000 years, Torah commentators have tried to drosh, have tried to explain the events that happen at the beginning of our next book, the book of Shemot and the book of Exodus, where we read that a new Pharaoh arises who did not know Yosef, who did not know Joseph, and who sees the Israelites growing in size and influence and therefore enslaves them. And could that enslavement, could all of that be simply because Joseph's story was forgotten and there was a new Pharaoh who didn't know? Maybe. Maybe. But another possibility comes in the form of a concept we see throughout the the Torah called Midah Kenegan Midah, which doesn't have a precise translation, but the Latin wording probably comes closest, lex talionis, that the punishment fits the crime. So this might be chutzpahdik to say, but I think it's a valid interpretation of the text to say that the Israelites are enslaved as a consequence of them enslaving the Egyptians. Let me say that again because I think it's important. I think it is a valid reading of the text that the Israelites become enslaved in Egypt as a response to them enslaving the Egyptians, taking advantage of their desperation during this period of famine. And with that reading, the end of Genesis is not a celebration of the journeying of our patriarchs and matriarchs. It is tochacha. It is condemnation of the actions that put the people of the covenant into a position of discrimination. Which contextually makes sense. Because after the Israelites are freed from Egypt, God tells them, 36 times throughout the Torah to love the stranger, quote, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And maybe this isn't a forewarning, but maybe this is a reminder, a reminder that mistreating people within a system of labor is antithetical to Jewish values. It is in direct contrast to who we are as Jews. I don't know where we go next. But I know that we have to go somewhere because while the world loses its collective mind and takes out its frustrations on employees rather than employers, on pieces of a system rather than the system itself, we must understand how diametrically opposed our Judaism is to such abuse. And we need to figure out how to talk about it because the heart of our tradition is at stake in those conversations. We need to love our neighbors, and we need to love our working neighbors because our neighbors work for us, with us, alongside us, not beneath us because dignity and respect are not just what's right. They're just, they're holy, they're kosher. Shabbat shalom, everyone. We'll continue with our Musaf.